We begin tonight with new developments in the former president's push to make any criminal charges against him disappear. He'll be in Washington tomorrow in court by choice, we should add, as a federal appeals panel hears oral arguments on his claim of presidential immunity in the January 6th case. Today, he filed a similar immunity claim on similar state charges in Georgia. Now, if they go his way, especially in the federal case, it could make him and any former president legally unaccountable for any crime they might commit while in office. It's the same notion another former president once drew scorn for embracing. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. By definition. Exactly. Former President Nixon said in 1977 is what the current former president is claiming now and what the courts never fully decided back then. Perhaps because Richard Nixon was never indicted, let alone on 91 felony counts. Perhaps also because at the time, lawmakers held him politically accountable, including members of his own party. By contrast, during the second Trump impeachment, most Republicans refused to. Quoting North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis at the time, quote, the ultimate accountability is through our criminal justice system. And if Republicans were reluctant back then to impose any political consequences on the former president, they're even more so now during his campaign to retake the White House. I want to play you something Mr. Trump has been saying lately and repeated over the weekend about those convicted and serving time for their crimes on January 6. They ought to release the J6 hostages. They've suffered enough. They ought to release them. I call them hostages. Some people call them prisoners. I call them hostages. Release the J6 hostages, Joe. Release them, Joe. You can do it real easy, Joe. They're not hostages, and he knows that. He's certainly done this before, trying to turn convicted violent felons into martyrs. But now, far from condemning him, some Republicans are actually using the same term. I have concerns about the treatment of January 6 hostages. Uh, I have concerns. We have a role in Congress of oversight over our treatments of prisoners. That was Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, chair of the House Republican Conference, the fourth ranking Republican in Congress. And that's what political accountability looks like within that party. It's the kind of criminal accountability or lack of it that the former president is asking the courts to give him now. Joining us now, conservative lawyer and Atlantic Monthly contributor George Conway. George, when you hear the former president, first of all, using the term hostages to refer to people who committed crimes on January 6th, what do you think? Oh, it's completely obscene. I mean, the notion that these people who tried to overthrow the government at his behest, to try to end constitutional democracy in America, and who are being prosecuted, who are indicted by federal grand juries, uh, for their crimes against the United States to say that they are hostages is, is just, I mean, definitionally absurd, but just morally obscene. And I, I just, the notion that, that people accept that and that, that he is not drummed out of public life for saying something like that, and that indeed people like Elise Stefanik um, parrot his lies is, is just, a, just one more condemnation, self-condemnation of the Republican Party. I, I just don't know how much lower they can go. As we mentioned, the, the former president's lawyers, they're going to argue tomorrow that his actions after the 2020 election were all covered by presidential immunity. How do you think this is going to play out? Uh, I don't think it's going to play out very well for the former president tomorrow. I think uh, one of the basic guidelines I always had in watching uh, arguments of any sort in court, and particularly appellate arguments, is the side that gets the most questions is probably the one going to get the, the short end of the stick in, a rule, in the ruling at the end. And I anticipate that most of the questions are going to be directed at uh, the Trump, uh, Trump and his lawyers on how you can possibly justify uh, giving a president who is sworn to uphold the laws of the United States and the Constitution of the United States, how, how that person can be above the law and any, anything can be um, lawful just because the president says so, says so, like the clip that you played of President Nixon uh, that he asserted, and that no one has ever bought that. It's completely inconsistent with our constitutional tradition, and, and there's just no way that a court is going to accept that. The former president is attending the oral arguments tomorrow. Do you think that's purely uh, for fundraising purposes, and he knows that's where cameras will be, and he'll make a statement uh, before and or after or both? Or is there a legal strategy at play here in, in terms of maybe some sort of impact on judges? No, I don't think there's a legal strategy in, in play, and, and that's certainly something I think he is too small-minded to be able to think through, think that through. I think what he's doing is 
he's seeking maximum attention. He's a, he's a narcissist. He thinks somehow that his presence um, can can persuade people generally. I think that he's you know I think he's gonna he wants to put on a show tomorrow. I think he wants to put on a show that he's somehow being politically persecuted and that he's being unfairly the victim of a witch hunt, which we've heard thousands of times. And I, you know, I just, you know, he probably will raise money off of it, but I don't think it's going to have any legal effect on how this, how this proceeding goes. Because he makes the argument, well, I'm, I'm, I have to go to court. I can't be on the campaign trail when in fact he actually doesn't have to be in court court tomorrow. The former president's attorneys also filed motions today in the, the election fraud case in Georgia, again, claiming the indictment should be barred under presidential immunity. If his claims of immunity are ultimately upheld on the federal level, what impact that would that have on a state court case like this one? Well, I think it would. I mean, I think the state court case would follow. Um, and I think that if he's if his presidential immunity claim is defeated in the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, which I think it will be in a matter of days, I think that will shut down his immunity claim in the Georgia case. And I don't think, you know, I think the real question will be, will the Supreme Court bother to take either one of those cases? And I think it's quite possible they'll take uh, the, the D.C. Circuit case, but it's also quite possible uh, that they may not, knowing that the trial is, is upcoming and knowing that they can review any immunity claims that he loses this time around after uh, he's convicted and sentenced. If the federal appeals court or the U.S. Supreme Court agree with the former president's interpretation of presidential immunity, just long term, what implications of that decision, what, what does it have on the presidency long term? Well, I think it would have more um, than an impact on the presidency. I think it would have a, a, a devastating and dangerous impact on our constitutional tradition and on the rule of law. I mean, if you look at, if you talk to students, of, uh, scholars of authoritarianism, they will tell you that, the, that authoritarian governance is the governance of criminals. It's the governance of criminal mobs. And, and, and an essential element of that is uh, immunity or impunity and the ability to break the law and to make the law whatever the uh, leader wants it to be. And not only is this immunity, this criminal immunity for basically any action relating to his job that he seeks, um, not consistent with our constitutional traditions, it would be an essential element uh, for an authoritarian regime. So I, I don't think it, there's any chance it's going to be accepted. And indeed, even if even if, it, if some kind of criminal immunity were accepted by the courts, it certainly wouldn't cover uh, the conduct he engaged in here, which was basically antithetical to his duties as president of the United States. So, I mean, the, in the civil realm, which is the cases that he's relying on, the, the only immunity that a president gets is for uh, actions that occur within the outer perimeter of their official responsibility. Here, he was way yeah. outside the outer perimeter. He was actually undermining his duties. How long do you think it'll take for the court to rule? Uh, I think it will be a matter of days. I think they, the, the, the Court of Appeals obviously knows what the timetable is here, obviously knows the importance. And at the same time, you know, they set, uh, they set a highly expedited schedule to hear this case at, at all tomorrow. And I think they're going to act swiftly after that. I don't think there's any question how they're going to rule. I think they're going to rule quickly. And I think well, the, the, the parties, uh, the United States and Donald Trump will be back preparing for this trial. And I think the trial is probably going to go off um, on a in April, if not shortly soon thereafter. You wrote a piece for The Atlantic on the U.S. Supreme Court's recent announcement that they're going to review the Colorado Supreme Court's decision to hold the former president ineligible to serve uh, as president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I'm wondering what stood out to you about the former president's petition to the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah, as I pointed out in The Atlantic piece, piece what was really odd about the petition was that it didn't point out particular errors um, uh, and, and focus on specific errors in the decision of the, uh, of the alleged errors in the decision of the Colorado Supreme Court. I mean, what you're supposed to do when you draft one of these documents is you're supposed to, a petition for writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court asking them to take the case, what you're supposed to do is to set forth the questions one by one on the inside cover uh, that, uh, that you say, that the questions of law that you say the lower court got wrong. And here they just simply put one question Basically, was Donald Trump improperly disqualified? And that's not the normal way you do things. And I think there are a couple of reasons why. And I think the most important reason 
is that when you ask that question, people say, oh yeah, he should be allowed on the ballot because they're not really familiar with the idea that the provision in the constitution that bars insurrectionists from holding public office. But when you actually break it down to the legal issues and factual issues involved, um, who's subject to the, the, the section three of the 14th amendment, is there some kind of necessity for congressional legislation to enforce it? And, and did Donald Trump engage in uh, insurrection for purposes of section, he loses when you actually break down the questions, the, into the, the case into its sub-questions the way lawyers and judges are supposed to do. Mm. George Conway, appreciate it. Thank you.